As Arsene Wenger said farewell to the Emirates, a stadium that, as much as anything, will stand as his legacy, the mind was drawn back to the end of the season 14 years ago. Ostensibly, the scenes were similar. Wenger, tall and erect, in shirt and tie, applauding awkwardly in the sunshine as the crowd sang his name. But the context could hardly have been more different. Back in 2004, Arsenal had just beaten Leicester City 2-1 to complete the league season unbeaten. As pundits queued up to add their plaudits, Amy Lawrence asked presently in this paper, is this as good as it gets for Arsenal? It turned out it was. Not that it seemed like it then. Wenger had arrived from nowhere, all but unknown in Britain, and had revolutionised the game. He changed diet and nutrition, modernised training methods, and exploited his knowledge of overseas leagues to sign great players at bargain prices. He changed the attitude to foreign ideas, erasing in a few weeks the doubts raised by memories of Dr. Josef Benglosh's ill-starred reign at Aston Villa. Wenger, in that sense, pioneered the cosmopolitanism that characterises the modern Premier League. And in 2004, he was leading a team that won three league titles in seven years towards a new stadium that would take him to a new financial level. The Ulmer march of progress seemed assured, but it was not. In retrospect, the turning point had come against Chelsea the previous month, on the 6th of April, when, with three minutes of the Champions League quarter-final second leg remaining, Wayne Bridge had scored the winner for Claudio Ranieri's side. Symbolically at least, that was when the balance of power in London shifted southward. Arsenal, through no real fault of their own, become victims of an irony of timing. Highbury, for all its charm, was cramped. Arsenal had to leave. Moving to the Emirates in 2006 was supposed to close the financial gap to Manchester United and the European elite. But in 2003, Roman Bramwich arrived at Chelsea and revolutionised the financial landscape of English football. Abramovich was not the first sugar daddy, but he was the first whose wealth seemed infinite. All that careful husbandry, all that plotting of new investment, was all diminished by an outside agent whose coming could not have been foreseen. It may seem normal now that foreign billionaires should buy Premier League clubs, but it was not then. What Abramovich had begun, Sheikh Mansour continued. Arsenal's position became impossible. They had the trappings and expectations of a great club, but not the resources. There was an FA Cup, then a Champions League final, and then, for a long time, nothing. It's not all doom and gloom, we have a strong belief. In facing overwhelming odds, Wenger changed. Perhaps age would anyway have wearied him, but in his second decade in the job, he succumbed to self-parody. It was though, when faced with the problem, he didn't ask how best to solve it, but how Arsene Wenger would solve it. What was the most Wengerian solution? When you don't win, you, uh, nobody jumps over the roof. Managers, after all, spend much of their working lives defending their philosophy, explaining why their way is the right way. It's hardly than surprising if in moments of crisis, they prefer stubbornness to facing the accusation of abandoning the principles. Wenger's great squads featured rough diamonds and hard men, but increasingly there came a template of the Arsenal player. The squad became full of small, technically accomplished creative midfielders, of pleasant young men. There was something of late period Brian Clough about this, different as Clough and Wenger were as personalities. Clough too had found his resources restricted after expanding the stadium, and as time had gone by, had lost the willingness or the capacity to deal with difficult characters. And Clough too, finding his lack of resources denied him a chance of a genuine title challenge, sought validation through other means, focusing less on winning than on style. Niceness for him and for Wenger became an end in itself, a surrogate trophy. Then, at the very end, the purse strings were relaxed once more. There were big signings. Mesut Ozil, Alexis Sanchez, Alexandre Lacazette, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, and a flurry of three FA Cups in Wenger's final five seasons. Would it be too harsh to dismiss those victories as yesterday's manager winning yesterday's competition or yesterday's football? Probably. But even as Wenger became the most successful manager in the FA Cup's history, dissatisfaction continued to mount. Nobody can seriously doubt that Wenger stayed on too long, but for all the frustration of the past few years, his influence on Arsenal and English football remains profound. His career may be a reminder that in sport, most professional lives end in failure, but he remains one of the greatest of all modern managers.